Now, before we get into AWS, is what I would like to just show you is this British Railways booklet from 1959 on the AWS system. And just to explain a little bit about the AWS itself, there's, we are, as ST engineers are used to the trackside equipment, but there's also the trainborne equipment. And the trainborne equipment, um, I'll just show you a very brief diagram inside here in a minute. But for the driver's purposes, he has what we technically call the sunflower, which is this indicator here. And this is normally black on black, and the yellow sunflower portion will show itself um, together with a, a horn indication for either a cautionary aspect of the signal. And the opposite to that is when you have a proceed aspect as a green, what will happen is the sunflower will disappear and you'll get a bell instead. Uh, any cautionary aspect the driver has to acknowledge. If he doesn't, after about seven seconds, I think it is, he gets a brake application and that starts to put the train's brakes on. Then he has to cancel that, uh, bring it to a stand and cancel it. Um, if he cancels it though, within the time, he's, he's on the winner. This is the sunflower on the, well, DMUs that I remember as a kid. Um, this is what you get, sealed unit, you get the sunflower indication. As you can see, it's come on there. Um, and just mention a few other things, there's the bell unit. You get the air horn, and a lovely picture there, actually showing you the equipment underneath the train itself for the, the actual um, the magnetic receiver on the train itself. So you can see there's a fair gap. It's got to receive that uh, magnetic field across that gap. And this booklet was designed just to show drivers and everything how it works. And it's 60,007 sat there in a the picture fitted with an AWS receiver ramp. The AWS system itself um, came about after a number of earlier patents and experiments using contact arms to actually trip um, brakes on trains at signals coming up to danger. Um, not all were successful, obviously there was wear and tear because you're hitting these contacts all the time. Um, you also have a problem that you can't go really fast with trains because when you do that you add more damage into the system. The Great Western tried the ATC system which was a, a electrical contact ramp in the track and that was offset so instead of having as you would with an AWS now where it's perfectly in alignment in the middle of the track the contact ramp was slightly offset skewed in much the same way you have with the overheads so as your train's ramp hits it it's not wearing a permanent groove in one spot all the time it's evening out the wear and tear uh, across the contact ramp and that was a that was electrical uh, method of doing it where a battery line side would supply a battery uh, voltage to the contact ramp and then into the contact from the locomotive and if the voltages were correct the valve wouldn't lift if the voltages were opposite the valve would drop and put the brakes on um, same way that the AWS works now but just quickly looking at this um, it's just showing you there the, the wheels of the train the braking system the brake cylinder the vacuum supply it's vacuum brakes of course warning horn and the condensers and the various indicators, battery system on the train, etc., and the receiver, um, all that play into this. And this is what this book basically goes into, just step by step. Even showing you down to the AWS and the locomotive on the steamer. And it goes into the various systems. I won't go too heavily into that because this is the train side of things and the video is more concerned with the S&T side of things out on the track. So, We'll crack on and show you the video now on AWS, the automatic warning system. Traditionally, AWSs are between 200 and 300 yards on approach to the signal they read towards. Now this can go higher with higher line speeds. Now what we have here is what we refer to as a fruit meter. This is the AWS test meter. And what's inside this is a set of calibrated springs and magnets. And the permanent magnet and electromagnet react against this and pull the tension of the spring down on the indicator. You'll notice there's a red, a yellow and a green section. These are the strengths of the magnet. Red is completely failed, yellow is failing, green is a good strength. There's also a little rotating bevel here with an E and a P on it. 
Now this is the permanent magnet and should have a P on it. The electromagnet should therefore have an E on it. So we've just test this about an inch or two. You can see it's already dropped down. If I sit it on it, you get a P and a good green. You can see the strength of the magnetic field decreasing and it's quite a strong field. Now as mentioned, there's the old style of AWS Electro. This is the mount on the side for putting a cabling into. As you can see, it has a giant belly underneath the actual magnet itself. Now this is the inside of a new pattern Electro AWS and the cover itself comes off with these four Allen screws. It looks symmetrical, but I'll be honest with you, it isn't. Most people have put a mark on it to show where it exactly goes back. Because if you put it on the wrong way round, you'll find it's a bit of an awkward fit. So there is a very slight difference in the sizing of the side and the long longitudes. Looking inside, <coughs> we have our terminal connectors. Now, a couple of things to notice here. You have some connecting straps across here. Now, at the moment, these are in parallel. So if our incoming wires come in on the negative and the positive, as it's labeled there, as you can see, uh, which is one and four terminals, then you need to make some connections. For the 12 volt connections, you strap out one to two, three to four, and that puts them into parallel. Uh, into parallel. For the 24 volt um, use of the system, same head, you strap out two to three, so you get rid of these, and it goes two to three, and that puts them into series. And again, there are slight variations. The, um, the old, um, electro and the latest pattern electro both have their positive and negatives on the, on the same terminals uh, one and four and the first version of the new style electro um, actually these were swapped round um, in our notes but that's gone back to the original now so it's as it as it shows you there positive and negative so you can't get it wrong if you do get it wrong when you test it you'll get the p on the electro instead of the E on the electro and it'll give it away straight away. Um, one of the flaws in these, I noticed this one hasn't got it, this one's got a drain hole now in the latest ones, but some of the first generation never had a drain hole in them and what used to happen is when you put the lid on the wrong way around you got a small amount of water ingress, it built up down there and it used to rot away the connections. But these fortunately have got drain holes in now I notice which is a good thing. Um, they are fairly watertight. You have some connections down there. You can just see onto the coils. You can't get at them. They're moulded into it. Um, what you have is an aperture on the left or the right that you can put your cable access in through. And there is some resistance readings you should have for an average um, unit. Just looking on this one here with them in parallel. I know the nuts aren't tight. I'm looking at... immediately to stay on about 30 ohms there about 30 ohms there as well and there are some average readings you should get and it depends on how tight the nuts are etc again looking back at things like the uh, resistances uh, in the guidance notes it says that the uh, in Coils when wired in parallel should be around about um, 60, so that's 30 between, and in series 15 ohms. Um, also, voltage wise, if it's a 12 volt system, you don't want to drop below about 10.5, and if it's a 24 volt system, you don't want to drop below about 21. Um, the 10.5 nominal current draws about three quarters of an amp. And the 24 volt system nominal current draw is a lot lower. It's about around about 0 0.38, 0 0.4 of an amp. Again, the green electro, which I can't show you because I don't have one of them. The green electro has a lot higher voltages, a lot higher current drains, uh, about one and a half amp. So there's differences in the system. Uh, you'll find very few green ones on Heritage Railways because obviously third rail, fourth rail systems, we don't have that many of them. Um, you will find a few AWSs on Heritage Railways though. Put in your thing here. So there we have the tensioning spring, which is set at the workshops, which operates onto the indicator itself. And we have the little small pole there for the E and the P. You can just see, it's that white circle there. 
and chop the rates off that magnet there that's pushed around. So I'm just going to look back into the book here because obviously there's a few things I missed in the video and looking at passing over a AWS caution so your signals at yellow, double yellow or red. So here we have our permanent magnet, sorry, permanent magnet and then electromagnet. So we're in this direction of travel and the first thing that's happened is we've passed over our permanent magnet which has been picked up on our receiver. It has started to operate the system. The condenser is holding the uh, the current there for that split second while it's passing over to the next magnet because obviously we don't want things to start happening straight away now if the electromagnet is not energized eg our signal is at caution or danger um, what happens is, as it says here the, um, the circular panel on the indicator the sunflower shows all black cutting off of the current to the valve does not however cause it to act immediately because the condenser maintains a current through it for one second now we've passed over the permanent magnet we're now on the electromagnet and it's not seen any current in the electromagnet so the signals of caution the electromagnet on the track is not energized and the electromagnetic valve proceeds to release after one second this causes the horn to sound and unless the driver takes action within the next three seconds the trains brakes apply and begin to be applied so it's three seconds not seven seconds as I said before um, so we get the next page up here Resetting it, on hearing the horn, the driver pulls the resetting handle and prepares to reduce speed by the train, by the ordinary brake handle. Um, the current also passes the receiver, returning the armature to its normal position and onto the electromagnetic valve, which closes, stopping the horn and stopping the system from kicking in. Uh, and it does say here, if the driver does not pull the resetting handle until after three seconds have elapsed and the brakes have been automatically applied, the valve in closing also releases the brakes again. So technically there is a seven seconds in the whole system. So it's taken, it's taken about seven seconds for the whole system to work. Now, however, if the electromagnet is energized, let's just jump to here. In this case, the electromagnet being energized causes the armature on the receiver to return to its normal position, which operates the relay box and the bell rings. As the elect electromagnet is very close to the permanent magnet in the track and the train is traveling at speed, this operation follows the first diagram, which is the left-hand diagram, after one second, and the current is restored to the electromagnetic valve, uh, sorry, electro-pneumatic valve, before the condenser has emptied. Thus, the valve is prevented from acting to sound the horn and start an application of the brakes. And there you go, and that's the system explained very simply. So that's the AWS explained, and I have a little bit of showing you out on the track while we look for the P on the permanent, the E on the electro when the signal's at green, and no, uh, it's stuck at red when it's at yellow, double yellow, or red. So make sure we get the correct indications. Now, just to show you, these are the bolts for mounting the AWSs to the AWS plates. They come in two sizes, a short and a long one. I appreciate this is a short one. This is a long one. Very similar to the mounting bolts you have on the old EP point machines. Mushroom headed or flat headed. Um, and you have a small countersinking little noggin there and once these have been in for a few years if they weren't put any grease or oil on because let's face it once they put down they tend not to be moved these will have uh, all furred up inside but you're a struggle to get off they're an absolute nightmare to get your bar underneath you have to put a bar underneath the plate to try and jam this up so you can take the nut off and if you've had a wet spot underneath an AWS and the PWA have come to change it, you will find all that bouncing where that wet spot was has rounded this head off into the actual uh, the little hole in the plate. I haven't got a mounting plate to show you, unfortunately. But as you can appreciate, I mean, this is just one that's in dry store at the moment, but you look at it, it's still got a little bit of rust on it. So if you come to take these apart, always take a bar with you. So on this one here, we have P and green. Electro because the signal's at red at the moment. Start of an E, but obviously nothing there because it's not pulled off. Now, this is a temporary speed restriction magnet that the P Way fit on the track. Looks the same as our magnets, probably a lot stronger because it's got a thinner casing on it. Uh, bolted to a fiberglass uh, bearer because obviously you don't want to drop track circuits. But depot magnets coming out of locomotive sheds, it's exactly the same magnet, just painted blue. Uh, not, very, not very big quite a strong magnet field as you can see